thank you everyone for coming to this session on getting off gas on going all electric. So my name is Rachel Goldblast and I am here with one of my other hats. If you've been here this morning, you saw me talk about natural building permits and processes. Here I am representing uh, Renew and myself and I'm here with my friend Mike Hayden from the Off Grid Shop. Yes? Yep. I got it right this time. I'm going to hand over to Mike and get him to talk a little bit about electrification and how it relates to off-grid systems. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is anyone here actually off-grid? Yep, awesome. Does anyone here want to go off-grid? Yep, there's a few. Right. I'll quickly tell you a story. I've taken three houses off-grid and I suppose to give you the... Um, yeah, so in 2013, we took our first house off grid and we had gas cooking and gas hot water back up. The house already had that when we brought it, so we just went with it. And the reality is when we took that first house off grid, it was in Seven Hills in the middle of Sydney, so it was an urban property. The technology actually just wasn't there at that point in time to go all off grid in an urban environment with batteries. Now, 2016, we moved to Lismore to the Northern Rivers. and. Um, Literally, the, the, the week we got there, there was a flood in 2017 when we were sort of set up. I should have took that as a sign, got out of there, but I didn't. So we then took our second house off grid, and uh, we did that. And my intention with that house was to be an all-electric house. So we did that with a 13 kilowatt solar system, and we took it all off grid. Now, we've actually done that same house again. So I've actually redone the whole renewable energy system and done it because now I have an electric car. And to me, one of the biggest reasons I wanted to get off gas was I couldn't create gas myself. I want to be self-sufficient. That's my intention of why I do what I do. Um, you know, I do care about the environment and that sort of stuff and making a difference. But the reality is everything I do, and I think if everyone can sort of take that same point of view, if your intention is to be self become self-sufficient in your own home, you're not going to rely on the network, which is going to help reduce the resources that we do use if you become self-sufficient. So... When we took the first house off in Sydney in 2013, uh, who here loves cooking with gas? Yep. So my wife, you know, her side of the family, they're really good cooks and they love cooking and they all love gas. And it was actually a really big challenge for me to get my wife to get off gas because she was like, nah, I love it. And we brought one of those induction cooktops, uh, like a portable one, and we're talking 2013, so they were terrible. So trying to convince Sarah to go off grid using this induction cooktop and go all electric in the next house, she wasn't having a bar of it. And um, so when we actually moved to Lismore, I brought another one. And one of the big things when I was doing some research on induction cooktops, and that was three or four years later, was one of the big problems people had was the usability of them. They're actually really hard to use. That's why my wife hated it. And when we actually did put the, you know, I brought a second induction cooktop and she used it, she loved it. She would never go back ever again now to, to gas. Uh, she just finds that the induction cooktop is actually so much more um, usable and controllable. Um, you can do a lot lower heats and things like that. So uh, that, that was a, a big thing. So uh, one of the other things that we did as well when our, in our first house and uh, that she hated, who knows those little turbo ovens? The little gas, easy cook, 737 turbo, little glass oven sits on a bench. You buy about 200 bucks from Harvey Norman. Um, that was another thing I brought, trying to go off all off-grid and be an electrician. She hated it because she couldn't fit her square pans in it, you know? So, back in 2013, it was a real challenge to try and go all electric because the technology just wasn't there. And not even just the cooking side of life, uh, batteries was another thing that really didn't happen. And when we, when we took a house off-grid the second time, when we moved to the Northern Rivers and did our first version of um, our house, the batteries really weren't there either, uh, but I just pushed through and this is what I'm like, I'll just give it a go and have a crack. And I was actually really lucky for me that within the next 12 months, the technology really changed. And that's what, and it was actually funny, but when we were in Sydney, when we'd have, when we'd, our batteries got low and things weren't working, we'd have to go downstairs and flick a switch to go back to the grid to get the grid or turn a generator on. So it's quite annoying to be cooking something Everything would just go black out. And uh, it's a funny story when my son was born, my wife was bathing him. Lucky my mother was there and they had a blackout and Sarah had to go down and turn the power and stuff on in the middle of a bath with a five day year old. So it wasn't fun. But um, when we moved to the Northern Rivers, I did this, the second system the second time. 
it was about six months into it and I was actually just talking to someone and I was telling them that we're off grid and my wife's like, no, we're not. I said, yeah, we are. She said, we're not. When, when, when did we go off grid? I was like, about six months ago, put the batteries in. And she's like, well, we're having a blackout. And I, it was just, she didn't really understand that. Well, I never explained to her because I just do things at home and just do what I do. Um, but she actually never, we had had a blackout. So for her, it was a very different experience going off grid in 2017 because she used to get so annoyed, have to go downstairs when batteries are flat, flick a switch to get power, you know? And then when I did it the second time, we had that power. And also around that time, with the technology, uh, with batteries, it was really hard to try and design and go completely off grid with the old, the old lead acid Telstra batteries in an urban environment. You know, it was a bit of a challenge. Panels weren't that efficient. Uh, 2017 is when things really started getting efficient and getting good. And then we bought an electric car and that's, you know, I think the timing in 2019 when we got the electric car, I just want to be self-sufficient, that's my thing. Um, I was actually really lucky where panels were, you know, I've got a 145 square metre roof, or our house is 145 square metres, and we have a 25 kilowatt solar system on it. Um, so we have a 25 kilowatt solar system on the roof where in 2013 there's no way we would have been able to, the technology wasn't there to be able to do that, if that makes sense. Um, it just wasn't there. So by having that and also the newer batteries, uh, we have 20 kilowatt hours of battery storage. And we are pretty self pretty self sufficient most of the time, except for it rains for a couple of days. We um we don't have enough battery storage to you know live our lives and charge our car. Our car is the biggest use for us at the moment, trying to be self sufficient. But the sun's shining, uh, we're pretty good. So yeah. So with, with the electric car, I suppose how I use it in my life, I'm actually pretty lucky. Um, we work from home, my wife and I. So our car is actually another battery for us because we take the kids to school, drop them off, come home, and then the car sits in all our excess solar. We charge our um, batteries at home, then our car gets charged, and then any excess goes back to the grid later on in the afternoon. So we use that car as a, the, it's the, um, it's where we dump our excess solar into our car, which is pretty cool. So uh, I actually just drove down from Lismore yesterday. Uh, I should have been here a bit earlier, got two flat tires on the way down. <laughs> it wasn't fun. So um, yeah. Electric cars don't have spare tyres in the first place, so if I got one spare tyre, it would have been whatever, but two was, doesn't matter what happened, it would have been the same situation. <laughs> and it was three in the morning in the middle of nowhere in an off-grid property, so, you know, I had to drive back a couple of k's to get phone service and all that fun stuff. But um, is anyone here, th are anyone here thinking about getting an electric car? Yep. Um, and a lot of people want to buy solar electric cars and batteries, and, you know, if you get a ton of money, great, do it, it's awesome. If you don't, one of the best things to think about, if you do have the ability and you're lucky enough to be at home of a day and charge your car, your car is a battery. So rather than try and put a home battery in at home and charge your car in the afternoon and things like that, it really works if you can be at home and charge your car because most house batteries are about 10 kilowatt hours. Um, where a car's, well, I've got a Tesla Model 3, they're 74 kilowatt hours. So you would never be able to charge the car from your home battery storage, if that makes sense. Um, but when, when I was off grid in Sydney for the first time, um, I had an electric motorbike. And I think I'm a motorbiker, I'm mad about motorbikes, and I think that's one of the biggest things that really help solve problems in the world, is if we all had motorbikes rather than cars, because who here drives around most of the time by themselves? <laughs> yeah? Get a motorbike. Um, <laughs> but the good thing about an electric motorbike is it uses you know, a third of the energy that a car uses, maybe even more, like maybe uses less. Um, you can, just an example, my motorbike, I used to be able to do 130 kilometres on 10 kilowatt hours, uh, and in my car, I do 400 kilometres on 70 kilowatt hours. So, you get a lot more range out of the motorbikes and things like that, and then they're a lot easier to charge and just deal with, and um, also really good to get free, free charges, because every car park in Australia, you're actually gonna start looking at this stuff now, near the fire hydrants, in the, car park doors, there's always a power point, just park your bike there, plug it in, off you go to your meeting, come back, your bike's charged. So, um, motorbikes can get some nice tight spaces around the world and get some free power. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, I think that's really about it. So, yeah, so, yeah, they're my three, three properties I've done. And just a bit of background as me, what I've done, you know, I've helped a thousand people take their homes off grid in the last... Um, so the six or seven years, we, we specialise in helping people take their homes off grid. And I've had a really good, fun experience doing that. And it, it tell you anything, the best money you will spend going off grid or 
try to be self-sufficient is the, how energy efficient you make your home. Energy efficient appliances, you know, I'm just about to become a certified passive house designer. That's actually been really fun. I've learned a lot doing that there. And um, a passive house, as an example, is normally uses 90% less energy than a typical home. So that, that will be the best money spent. If you want to do anything, just make sure your home's really energy efficient because you don't want a house that, like Rach said, leaks a ton of air and they need to run a lot of energy to heat that same room back up, if that makes sense. So yeah, get yourself educated on how to design your home and make it energy efficient will be the best money spent. I've got a question. So of all of those people that you have taken off grid, um, how many people were also doing the transition to getting off gas at the same time and what does that mean for um, solar and batteries, like in terms of size? Yep. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I'm just going to talk some numbers here, dollar figures. When I first started, when I first moved the Northern Rivers, the average size solar system we were selling was about $15,000 off grid. And most people just wanted a little cabin weekender and they were doing gas because it was for finance. You know, like I call gas finance um, because that's all you're really doing is if you don't have the money up front, you're spending it over time with gas. So. Come 2018, 2019, that really changed that most people wanted to be self-sufficient off gas, they just didn't have the money. But come 2018, 19, the technology was really there and the cost, it was actually only an extra two or three thousand dollars to do a full electric build. Induction cooktops were actually good to use, people were happy with them. There's little turbo ovens. And it wasn't actually that much more expensive to go completely off gas. And I think most customers off grid would love to be that self-sufficiency. It was just the money thing in the early days. And I think because the technology is there and the prices are really, well, they're actually going up at the moment, but the price has got to a point where people can afford to go off grid. And I, I always used to say to people in the early days, like, you're better off going and getting finance from a finance company and trying to do your house all electric because over the years, you'd save more money paying finance than paying for gas, if that makes sense. So um, that's a highly recommend. If you don't have the money, finance it. If you do want to go completely off-grid and be self-sufficient with, with that gas, because, yeah, it'll be um, cheaper in the long run and you're doing better for the environment.